Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. Welcome. My name is Wojtek Rustecki. I'm a senior director of solution services at TechSoup, and I'm joining from Warsaw, Poland. Whoever you represent, one of the more than 400 foundations or more than 100 corporations we collaborate with, or you're here on behalf of, the, <clears throat> of one of the 60 free TechSoup global network partners situated all around the world, or you're brand new to TechSoup global network, hi. We are eager to connect with you. TechSoup is a nonprofit social enterprise that connects nonprofits with mission critical resources worldwide. It's a founding member of the TechSoup Global Network. We are glad you're here. In the first of our new series, Civil Society Insights, brought to you by the TechSoup Global Network, we are expecting attendance from all around the world today, including impact leaders, funders, and change makers from civil society organization, organizations <coughs> sorry, of all sizes. Please introduce yourself in the chat and indicate where you're joining us from today. Today's event is a deep dive into local data and analysis for greater impact. A fantastic set of leaders I admire from Gord Resource Center in Ukraine, Hauser Stiftens in Germany, and Studesny Via from Czech Republic will share what they've asked and learned from three unique studies focused on the organizations they serve. Listening closely to our communities and exploring and surveying their particular needs local NGOs face is critical in TechSoup Global Network. Together, we can learn from the data and make decisions to guide resources that can lead more people to do significantly more good. The TechSoup Global Network connects the largest civil society network in the world with a vital philanthropic supply chain. Let me share some data with you. Over more than 15 years, it has facilitated more than 50 billion US dollars in resources for the civil society sector. Thanks to the global network, 178,000 organizations in 236 countries and territories were connected with over 2 billion US dollars in software and financial resources last year. With a local presence of some of the most effective technology for good nonprofits in 63 countries and operating in 39 languages, our network gather, gathers a vast amount of local insights about the people and organizations, you know, all from all around the world. And we gather information, you know, like what can help those organizations to you know, succeed and you know, how to uh, solve some of the uh, help, you know, like how to, sorry, how to, you know, we, we gather all the you know, information and you know, we try to analyze those information and you know, together we can, we can help them solve some of the worst, most challenging problems. We are happy to, uh, to have a chance to share with you uh, some of the, insights we, we've gathered and we can try to work and improve together. Today's event uh, is sponsored by Cloud Signature Consortium. The Cloud Signature Consortium is a global group of industry, government and academic organizations committed to driving standardizations of highly secure and compliant digital signatures in the cloud. Just a note that all lines are muted but you will be able to ask questions at any time by typing them in the Q&A panel of a webinar. You can also ask questions and share comments in the audience chat. <clears throat> and you will receive emails with this presentations, recording and links, so you can go back and watch anything you might have missed. And now I have the great pleasure of introducing our moderator, Jana Sullivan. Jana is founder and CEO of Conscious Consulting, the first sustainability agency in Brussels, where she advises institutions, businesses, and civil society. She's also professor of climate diplomacy at the European Institute in Nice and a published author on sustainability engagement. Thank you, Jana, and over to you. Thank you, Wojtek. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here today. I've got a deep personal commitment to seeing NGOs in Europe have voice and agency and uh, digital capital is key, capacity is key to that. Um, before we meet our speakers, we have just uh, an hour today, so a very short session. I want to start by reflecting on digital transformation together with you. So why is digital capacity 
particularly important to civil society? What do we as society risk if access to technology is not fairly shared across all of society? Why is it vital to enable civil society access to technology and cloud enabled operations? Uh, we really want to hear from you, so do put your questions uh, in the Q&A as we proceed. We'll get to the questions uh, later, we'll get to answer them. So today we have three TechSoup Global Network partners um, with us. Um, they surveyed thousands of local orga organizations in uh, the Czech Republic, in Germany and in the Ukraine to understand their digital maturity and their needs. Um, and I've seen the responses in the reports and they clearly show that civil society organizations, they need access to technology and they need essential digital resources, digital infrastructure and digital operations to continue to build essential capabilities to make the world a better place, helping their local communities one person at a time. Whether it's providing food or shelter, protecting human rights, driving social justice, or defending the world's forests or oceans, digital transformation maximizes organizations' power to do more good. I have now the great pleasure to introduce our speakers to you, our dynamic, three dynamic speakers. First, I want to introduce Marcus Becker. He is Director of IT for Nonprofits and Grants for Nonprofits at the House des Stiftens, which is a social enterprise and certified B Corporation serving NGOs in Germany, Austria, Liechtenstein, and Switzerland. Uh, in 2020, uh, House der Stiftung supported 80,000 NGOs, enabling them to save 40 million euros on technology. Wow. Um, HGS has been a partner in the TechSoup Global Network since 2008, facilitating technology donations worth more than 500 million euros. And Marcus is joining us today from Munich, Germany. Hello, Marcus. Next, I want to introduce you to Radka Bistvitska, she is executive director of the Czech nonprofit organization VIA, VIA Association, which helps Czech nonprofits with digitalization and technology and provides them with the tools and knowledge needed to successfully function in the digital world. Uh, VIA offers a range of capacity building workshops and a portal connecting corporations and volunteers with Czech NGOs. And hello, Radka. She's joining us today from the from Prague in the Czech Republic. Welcome. And last but not least, Bogdan Maslish is executive director of Gurt Resource Center, if I pronounce that correctly, Ukraine's premier accelerator of societal transformation. Important role there. It reaches more than 50,000 registered users through its online portal and reaches the largest constituency of civil society organizations in the country. So since 2016, GERT has been a partner in the TechSoup Global Network, enabling Ukrainian civil society organizations to benefit enormously from donated and discounted software, promoting digital transformation of Ukrainian society. Um, GERT promotes open governance, digital literacy, and access to grants and funding for civil society organizations. Welcome Bogdan, he's joining us today from Kiev in Ukraine. So we have a wide range of speakers for you today. So each of the teams of our speakers survey thousands or hundreds of civil society organizations independently. Um, but there are some overlaps in the findings that are central to our discussion today. So I'm gonna ask the first question so we can get to the answers because that's why you're here. So first, um, all of you, please share briefly why and how you conducted your research and please share an interesting finding. I'm gonna to turn to Bogdan, over to you. Thank you, Joanna. I'm a little bit nervous because we're going to talk about very important issue of digital transformation for civil society. So please forgive my, I don't know, temptation. So um, speaking about what we do in Ukraine, uh, we actually conduct biannual study of um, digital needs uh, and of Ukrainian nonprofits. Uh, you may see that uh, different donors, including Charles Stuart Mott Foundation, SIDA, the Swedish government, and uh, US Embassy in Ukraine, they supported uh, these studies in different years. Last study in 2020, we collected uh, 1,000 uh, responses from Ukrainian nonprofits. 
and it's a pretty good number. And in order to stimulate uh, Ukrainian nonprofits to participate in the study, we even announced a drawing for different prizes among, among respondents. Uh, for example, we offered them uh, free software licenses, uh, even power banks, and due to support of US embassy in Ukraine, we offered our services uh, helping Ukrainian nonprofits to deploy uh, cloud, different cloud solutions. Uh, you may see from the picture that our study actually proved assumptions that uh, lack of funding and lack of knowledge are key barriers that uh, do not allow Ukrainian NGOs to use available ICTs in full capacity. The study results, uh, why it's important for, now, for us, because uh, these results, they are guiding us uh, in planning our activities on how to help Ukrainian nonprofits to overcome these key barriers. We constantly disseminate information on available funding for to cover expenses of digital transformation. We also offer different educational programs, both uh, online and in face-to-face -face, uh, formats. And I also would like to mention that we had a great event uh, presenting these results to Ukrainian audience. And besides uh, nonprofits and donors, we were happy that um, I, Ukrainian IT companies participated in this presentation and also representative of Ministry of Digital Transformation. So the report was particularly very important because it provided a mirror to Ukrainian nonprofits and especially in the area of cybersecurity, but probably we can talk about it later. Thank you very much, Bogdan. Um, I'm going to ask the, the next, same question actually to Radka now. Um, so please share why and how you conducted your research and share an interesting finding. Thank you, Bogdan. Over to you, Radka. Uh, thank you. So we conducted our research uh, at the beginning of uh, this year with cooperation with the local Open Society Foundation. Uh, we gathered uh, more than 300 responses. It was a very long survey, so, so we are very happy that, that we uh, have this many uh, valid responses. And uh, the study or the survey uh, was covering broad range of topics from office software and hardware infrastructure, cybersecurity, electronic signatures to obstacles and priorities that organization uh, face uh, when it comes to IT development. Uh, we did the study because uh, we are first, we are not aware of any similar study of this scale conducted in Czech Republic previously. And uh, so far we were working uh, on many assumptions that we have uh, had about the NGO sector when it comes to their IT needs. Which, uh, which came from our own work with the NGOs, of course, but, but uh, we said it's time to have like really hard data to, to confirm our assumptions. And uh, a lot of those assumptions were confirmed. Uh, some findings were uh, surprising for us, uh, especially for me, the most surprising was that uh, there is a big lack of uh, hardware offers for nonprofits or uh, there is a there is a very high need uh, in the nonprofit sector uh, for new hardware or for uh, or uh, rather that they have old hardware which does not support uh, they, the work they, they have and I kind of thought that this this problem was solved already and apparently it's not so so that was one of the big ones or uh, for example the security the state of security, uh, IT security in nonprofits in Czech Republic is maybe a bit worse than I expected. So, so uh, yeah. And also, I want to mention that uh, the the survey showed that there are actually six types of organizations when it comes to using their IT and when it comes to their needs and and priorities. And uh, this was very interesting to me that to, to see uh, that. There can be there can be statements made about the whole sector, but uh, there are 
very important nuances uh, when we look into more uh, detailed data. So, so that's something that we want to work with uh, much more as an organization in the future. Thank you very much. So we'll get to those nuances a bit later. So we've heard from wide range. I mean, there's a common, common theme there, cybersecurity already, it seems, but also some surprising findings in terms of lack of hardware. OK, Marcus, um, over to you. What, what did you find in your survey? Thank you, Joanna. And I just want to take a moment and appreciate the opportunity of uh, being on this panel today. So thank you to the uh, Texas Global Network, our sponsors, and obviously excited Radka Bogdan to have a conversation with you today. Um, so you also, I think, asked about, oh, why, why go on this yeah. endeavor? And uh, uh, at some points, also uh, quite painful, I must admit, endeavor of conducting research on a larger scale. Um, our why is pretty simple. I think we, at, as a B Corp, we want to start a conversation and we want to start an honest and open conversation with all relevant actors around civil society on what is the status quo of digitization in Germany. Uh, we felt strongly that there's not enough evidence around to have a serious and solid conversation on this. And that's why we felt strongly and compelled to, to start on that journey. Um, and as with all big journeys, et cetera, um, it's better to not go alone. So uh, we also went ahead and partnered with what we believe um, strong institutions that uh, can complete our skill set as, as a social enterprise. So we're incredibly fortunate, A, to partner with the University of Mannheim as one of Germany's leading research universities um, as a scientific elite, and B, with the Federal Ministry of the Interior. Uh, they were um, kind enough to sponsor this research with a, with a generous research grant. Um, just to share maybe two numbers on, on scope and research to also compare that with, with the Czech and Ukraine research that you heard about already. Um, we had about 5,000 nonprofit respondents. Um, the average time to complete is very similar to Radka, yours, about 35 minutes, and all of this accumulated in 1.3 million data points that we're able to collect on this topic. So um, I'm happy to dive into all of this at detail, but just to the audience, all of this data is more or less publicly available at our um, homepage, um, and we'll share the link afterwards also with an English-speaking executive summary, uh, and I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Marcus. Um, so another question, then let's get a bit deeper now. So what about the, the kind of perspective of the nonprofit? So based on your findings, um, all of you, um, what does the typical, uh, if there is such a thing, um, nonprofit look like in your country in terms of uh, resources or digital resources, budget, staffing, digital capacity and so forth? Um, I'll turn first to Radka. Yeah, thank you. So uh, as I uh, kind of started to, to, to say in the previous segment, it's really hard to say how the, how the uh, typical nonprofit looks like, because there are many, many types of nonprofits. But when it comes to uh, IT behavior, uh, the study showed us, or, or uh, from the study, we uh, derived six basic clusters that show uh, similar behavior within the group in, in, in the cluster. And uh, the, the axis in which we divided the clusters were first the type of organization, and uh, that is, we call them civic, volunteer, and professional, but to simplify it, let's say the professional organizations are those who are uh, employee-based, uh, volunteer organizations are those who are volunteer based, but they do have some kind of a center who, who uh, you know, you can imagine organization like Scout. So they have a few employees who support a large network of volunteers. And the civic organizations uh, are those who I would describe as activist based. So you would have your local group fighting against corruption in the municipality or something like that. They do it completely in their free time. It's not their main work. So this defines the way they conduct business if I may use these words, but it showed that we need to do a more nuanced uh, uh, diversification and, and uh, based on budget slightly and mainly on the number of actual employees. And uh, then when we, when we, uh, when we look into uh, these clusters, we can see big differences between them, like big professional organizations, I'm saying that means uh, 50 plus employees, 
for example, uh, tend to use Microsoft-based tools or Microsoft tools. The smaller organizations tend to use Google tools and there's like really significant data for supporting this. Or for example, the big professional organizations state as the biggest obstacle uh, that the employees don't want to learn how to use new technology. So not the money, but the employees. With smaller organization, it's the money, it's the lack of funding. So, so, so based, based on that, we can, we can see really, uh, really interesting differences. And, and one of the things that we did that we, we made a profile of those six clusters describing, uh, describing all these nuances. That's really fascinating. Wow. How does that compare with, uh, with Germany, Marcus? Yeah, I think um, we'll most likely, uh, obviously we didn't ask the same uh, nonprofits, but we would most likely find similar clusters. And I just wanna maybe illustrate that with two data points. Um, in our research, we found that only around 70%, 17, excuse me, percent of nonprofits actually have a dedicated resource to IT. Um, and so we're not even talking about, is that resource willing to learn? Do they have enough time, et cetera? It's just, is it there? Do we have a focal point, a go-to person who takes care of that topic? And if you look at that um, number of nonprofits who, say, who raise their hand and say, oh yeah, I do have uh, someone staffed at this, 70% of those have one person. Um, so that is marginal, I think is fair to say. And this is just obviously one shallow data point that allows us to get a sense of how things are. So what we try to do in our research overall is identify certain set of variables and build a model out of that. And that model was aimed at measuring something that we call digital maturity. So how fit, how trained is a nonprofit overall in digital topics? And we find supporting evidence that overall this digital maturity, this fitness, this digital, um, actually has a positive impact on KPIs that we presume are relevant for organizations such as how are you able to retain uh, employees? How are you able to retain supporters? How effective are you in campaigning and keeping your messaging across to your target audiences? So I think the bottom line there is that um, that resourcing in IT, et cetera, directly affects how effective you can be as an organization. Wow, so it seems like we have to move from like marginal to mainstream to maturity if we want to uh, still enable NGOs to have a really strong impact over time. I mean, the, 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 the digital world is changing so fast and they obviously need to keep up. Uh, Bogdan, how does that look in Ukraine for you? In, in Ukraine, we have uh, over 100,000 registered non-governmental organizations now. And uh, the structure of the sector is uh, pretty similar to what uh, Radka described. So it's almost the same. And uh, the majority of sector is based on uh, volunteer work. And probably it can be surprising for the world that uh, almost half of Ukrainian non-governmental organizations have annual budget that is less than 4,000 US dollars. Uh, maybe this fact uh, explains why 41% of NGOs do not have any IT professional who may help them with uh, understanding and satisfying their digital needs. And on this graph, you may see that only 12% of Ukrainian NGOs, they actually confirm that uh, ICT information and communication technologies they actually use fully meet their needs. And almost one third, you may see almost one third of Ukrainian NGOs, they do not pay any attention to match their needs and uh, available ICT. Wow, so there's, um, there's, a, there's a lack, there's a need. That's for sure. Um, and what about the COVID-19 pandemic then? How has that impacted NGOs um, in your communities? Um, um, Marcus, what about Germany? How did, how's it gone down in Germany? How, how have NGOs been impacted by the pandemic? Has this made things worse? 
Mm. Yeah, I think in this case, actually, I will say that this, this sounds odd to begin with, but I hope that you and the audience can follow along. Uh, we got tremendously lucky with that pandemic in a sense that we actually conducted our research in October of 2019. So just before uh, the pandemic started to hit. So and then we actually were able to collect a second wave mid pandemic uh, as of this mid this year. So we actually have two solid data points of the same nonprofits that we could look at and try to derive some of some understanding of what is happening there and since you specifically asked about sort of say some of the uh, consequences what we can see is actually that i think on an overall level the message that the respondents are sending to us that yes they were negatively affected but mild in consequence that means that most of them actually believe that they can build back uh, positive in a sense and that they actually will come out of this more resilient which was i must admit quite a surprise to us um, and actually to also just illustrate this with three concrete things that we heard um, as positive outcomes uh, was number one, a positive um, understanding and sort of say recognition of the work that civil society organizations contribute to our society, um, an improved feeling of community around constituents, but employees, etc. Um, but also the uh, space for learning and creativity. And I think we all know this um, from lockdowns and whatever you're personally in for the pandemic, there is space and you can try to utilize that in the best. And we see that in nonprofits in Germany, for sure. Thank you. Um, Radka, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, so uh, we, we did not uh, ask specifically uh, about how the organizations changed during the COVID or how they uh, IT changed. But from what we can see uh, uh, in the results of the survey and what we hear in our daily work with, if, with NGOs, we speak with them on the phone, exchanging emails with them. Uh, not surprisingly, the, the pandemic brought a super high adoption of cloud, like uh, in, in, a, in a speed that we didn't see before. So, so we had many, many requests for, uh, for, for the cloud services that are provided uh, in cooperation with TechSoup. We have had many questions about how to conduct online webinars, how to do online meetings, how to do, how to do home office effectively. And, and we, 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 based on this demand, we, we had a few webinars on, on those topics and, and wrote some articles. So, so there are definitely kind of structural uh, structural changes within the NGOs because they had to learn how to, how to use cloud, uh, et cetera. For example, in our study, uh, we saw or 75% of respondents said that they are using cloud-based cloud storage, which is, uh, which is very surprisingly high number though i would be i would be careful because uh, that does not necessarily mean that they are using it effectively and fully it basically just means that someone in the organization is using it but uh, and still it, it's it's a super high number and when i compare it to the data available in the czech statistical office for the whole commercial sector it's like seven times higher <laughs> than, than what Czech statistical uh, office says is a standard uh, in, in, in Czech Republic. So, so that's definitely an interesting change. That's fascinating. These data points that you're coming out with are really fascinating. And um, the data shows like really strong demand for digital capacity, that's for sure. But it seems there's also quite significant gaps um, in being able to meet that demand. And it's interesting to know how the, your local surveys generate findings that resonate globally. Um, I was looking at a TechSoup um, survey, which was funded by Okta, um, that was that reflected 11,700 nonprofits across 135 countries and 41 languages. That was a mammoth piece of research. And communications and collaboration tools, like we all needed during the COVID-19, during the lockdown, are they are the, they're the most desired digital solutions. Um, so just to a data point, a quarter of them have a defined strategy only for achieving digital readiness, where while only half of respondents have the resources to implement their strategy. So there's a great need. Um, I can see some questions coming into the chat. Thank you for those. Um, do, we're gonna get to those in a minute. I'm just gonna ask a couple more questions and then we're gonna get to um, audience questions. So do put your questions in the Q&A. Do vote for the questions you find most important. 
Um, but just a, a quick other question um, to you. To, I'll ask Marcus first. So what are some of the unique gaps you've identified through your research? Um, so is it people skills or is it infrastructure? I mean, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but what is it really that's most needed? Where are the real gaps um, in your research? Marcus first. Yeah, I think the the answer on an aggregated level, um, so on civil society as a whole, needs to be both. Uh, and I think this is, shouldn't become as a surprise. Um, high tech infrastructure without knowledge is probably pretty underutilized and the other way around. Um, so I think obviously on an individual organizational level, you would have to balance that out. Uh, but we see strong evidence in our data that that is a continuous challenge, that balancing act of know-how and resourcing and combining that and making sure that that grid is transitioned into your work is what is the most and crucial challenge to nonprofits. So right now our, our uh, sort of say panel reports back that I think 15% of nonprofits see themselves both as resourced enough and knowledgeable enough to really rise to that challenge. Interesting. Yeah. So that's um. So um, what about um, uh, Bogdan? I didn't ask you the previous question. I don't know if COVID has had a similar impact. Um, but um, what what is your feeling about the unique gaps that you've identified in your um, country in Ukraine? Um, what does it look like there? What what is it? What is it people or infrastructure or what's what's most needed in your perspective according to the data, Bogdan? Um, thank you, Joanna. I agree with Marcos, it's both. But uh, what was surprising for us that uh, actually from 2018, the number of NGO representatives that uh, have been trained in using in digital security and using of different information communication technologies, uh, this number remains the same so it's less it's about 20 percent of NGO representatives and this graph uh, is for me it's uh, pretty self-explanatory so it's I believe it's a huge gap that we have to somehow address uh, for Ukrainian civil society and also the issue of um, digital security and this this is this issue appears again and again in our discussion and uh, unfortunately what we see that uh, a lot of uh, ngo leaders they underestimating uh, risks and uh, like threats that can uh, uh, they can face uh, if they do not pay enough attention to the issue of uh, digital security. This graph demonstrates that only like, uh, so it's uh, really very little number of organization, Ukrainian organization that practice so-called security audit. The vast majority, they either don't care about it or never heard about uh, security audit uh, as an option to understand uh, needs and uh, plan capacity building in this area. Wow, that's a real worry indeed. Um, Radka, what's your, um, what's your view? What are the biggest gaps? What have you identified? Yeah, uh, I totally agree with both Marcus and Bogdan that uh, uh, the gaps are both on the infrastructural and the knowledge side. Uh, for example, uh, our uh, survey showed that 40% of organizations cite the lack of funding as the biggest barrier for uh, IT development or, or development at all, which is not surprising that's an evergreen in NGO sector. But sir, what was more surprising, and I hinted uh, on that previously, that uh, this was true uh, for five of the six clusters that we had. But with the uh, big, big uh, employee-based organizations, suddenly there was there uh, was the uh, the employee hesitation for adapting new technology was the number one. So so. I think that once you hit that stage that you have kind of enough money to, to cover your basis, you realize that the problem lies in the knowledge and that you need skilled, uh, skilled employees to be actually uh, effective when adopting new uh, technology. So, so 
that definitely supports uh, 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 both what Marcus and Bogdan said. And uh, I would also I would also very much agree on the security issues. Uh, we specifically asked about uh, things like uh, did your organization uh, face some cyber attack and uh, did you did you have some data leaks in your organization? And uh, for example, 29%, that means one of the three organizations that we ask or uh, have experienced some kind of cyber attack. Some of those were, uh, you know, like attacks, uh, attacks like phishing and stuff like that, but, but very, very often they said that they encountered uh, website breaches or, or data breaches, uh, like more sophisticated kind of, or DDoS attacks or, or, or some kind of that. So third, of our organizations are, are facing cyber attacks, which is a huge, huge number. And at the same time, only 35% of organizations have written cybersecurity rules and do, uh, uh, do educate their employees uh, on cybersecurity. So like the easiest or, or not easiest, but the cheapest way would be to support NGO sector to do this because it the prevention, when it comes to cybersecurity, prevention is the cheapest we can do, and it's very effective, actually. So, so there is there is a huge gap, a uh, huge gap, definitely in that. Wow, and we're talking about real people and real issues and, and real data. That so um, obviously that's a real significant issue. Um, I just wanted to come back to Marcus about, you know, we talked about funding, we talked about people, we talked about skills, but um, did you not have a data point? I, looked at your research that there are other areas in terms of kind of organizational skills um, that take more than resources to fill. Marcus, did you have something to say about that? Yeah, and I think um, Radka, you, you highlighted this in Evergreen, right? So I'm sure the audience, everybody that connects with civil society has at some point in their professional or volunteer life heard the Evergreen of resource constrained organizations. Um, what we find in our data is that and what also I must admit to a certain extent, I believe is the largest challenge and worries me thus, is that I think, or we believe to a certain extent, organizations need to overcome what, what we call a very one dimensional understanding of digitization. So that is most of the times I try to transfer a manual process, a pen and paper based process via tools into something that is digital. And I wanna be absolutely clear, this is an important prerequisite and that needs to be done. But the magic happens beyond that. And that is really understanding and uh, what digital or what digital civil society organization can do at its core to really change the operational model, to really change how they serve their constituents, how they interact with their target audiences, how they drive their campaigning. All of this really has the potential to basically reinvent a whole organization. And we know that is by no means easy, especially if you're resource constrained. Wow, so it's not just efficiency, but it's also like impact Absolutely. that um, can yeah. be generated. Wow. Okay, so before we get to audience questions, thank you, Marcus, that's really an interesting insight. Um, so we kind of, digital transformation means kind of organizational transformation in a way in terms of impact transformation. So there's so much potential, it's really interesting. Um, um, but, you know, given what all of you have said that there's really a, a, a lack, or there's some real gaps here um, in all of the countries that really worries me. Um, working as I do with many uh, different campaigns, different NGOs, um, you know, it's the capacity to deliver and protect um, that we really all, all rely on um, with NGOs in, in Europe. So, um, you know, they're facing increasing challenges. Um, we, are, we all are to democracy, rule of law, rule of law, even media independence these days. And so the fact that NGOs may lack the digital capacity to defend basic rights, it worries me that we have, we're supposed to be, they're supposed to be, we're all supposed to be stepping up to achieve the UN global goals in 2030. We're all acting for climate, tackling so, social inequity. Um, and the fact that some NGOs may not have the digital capacity to communicate and collaborate is a real worry. Um, before I get to the audience questions, I, I just wanted to ask you, um, ask you all actually, so based on your own experience, as well as the data, 
Um, what are the main challenges for nonprofits in improving their digital capacity, uh, capabilities? I mean, can we be optimistic? Um, and what's really needed? Bogdan, I'm going to turn to you um, to answer this one first. I'm not sure that I'm going to be very optimistic, but <laughs> I'll try my best. Uh, you know, we saw that uh, actually the main challenge is, uh, is the fact that uh, NGO leaders, they are underestimating the importance of digital transformation. You know, we as individuals, we all live in digital era and uh, we somehow take it as, as something that they but that is already here, but uh, it doesn't mean that our organizations are ready for all challenges. And it doesn't mean that uh, we can effectively serve our clients, our beneficiaries uh, in this uh, digital era. And uh, what we learned that NGO leaders in Ukraine, not all of them, of course, but the majority, they do not prioritize enough uh, building digital competencies of their staff and volunteers. Also, we didn't see enough investment in the development of digital infrastructure of non-government organizations. These are main challenges we see. Okay, um, thank you. And Marcus, um, did you want to add something there? I think we need to be optimistic. Uh, this is the only pathway forward. Um, and I think we rightfully should be optimistic if I think we, what, what we call is a uh, mind the gap, right? So I think we are on the cusp of a potential um, divide forming between more digital advanced nonprofits and their peers. Uh, that divide, our data shows, comes with the risk of an uneven distribution of resources that is scarce to begin with. Um, however, if we close that uh, and if we uh, make an effort to uh, really take all of the nonprofits in civil society that we have, all of the constituents that we serve, um, I think we can be optimistic and should be optimistic that the potential can also that comes with the utilization can also be utilized for civil society as a whole. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, Radka, did you want to have a, a final comment on that? Um, and then I'm going to throw the floor open to the questions. We've got several in the Q&A. Radka, did you want to have a comment on that? Uh, yeah, maybe following up on the optimistic note uh, is, well, we are tech, so we are here to help support nonprofits to, to actually do come to the future with us and and use the technologies and the new technologies to their advantage because that's the important thing we don't want them to use the technologies just because but we want them to use it to be more effective and to actually save their resources as and we all know very well that, that the resources that into have are very scarce so so anything that can help them uh, help them save time and help them focus more on their actual mission and not to do infrastructural challenges of daily day uh, day to day operations that's great and i i believe that for many organizations uh, cloud can be really the first step in, in, into that and, and that we should and need to support adoption of cloud in nonprofits for many reasons that we already said uh, First of all, cloud helps a bit with the hardware problem because uh, because having uh, uh, cloud-based storage means that I don't have to have a physical server in my office. That saves me money and saves me people to have to take care about that. Also, the the cloud that is provided by the big companies like Google, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, and such is always a hundred times more secure than any solution that, that, that the NGO would probably uh, create by uh, itself. So especially for small NGOs who uh, ca cannot, uh, uh, cannot uh, 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 or do not have enough resources to take care of those issues and they have to prioritize, prioritize something else. Uh, you know, moving to cloud uh, uh, can mean that, that they are suddenly uh, just their data is more secure just by doing that. Of course, it means that the employees have to have to work with the data in a certain way and they have to edu educate it in the threads, uh, etc. But uh, but still, still. 
And uh, of course, moving to, to cloud or digitalizing uh, uh, your processes is the first step to automation and automation saves time of everyone. So uh, yeah, I see a lot of, lot of I, I, see, I see a future where it can help, uh, help NGOs very much. Yeah, and it's, and it's frankly great. Um, I'm coming into this with a, a relative novice. I'm totally non-digital, but I've worked with NGOs and in this area for 20 years. Um, and it's amazing that they have your resource uh, available to them. So that's really great. I'm just going to get to the audience questions now. So I'm going to ask the second one first, just for fun, um, which is, um, um, where are we now? Which is from... Uh, oh, that's the first question, sorry. Um, from Eva Consal, if I pronounce that, will the data, oh, sorry, should there be a role for funders? I'm going to ask this to any of you who wants to answer. Should there be a role for funders, grant makers and others to propose, but also to fund along the digital gaps in the civil society organisations? So the question is, is there a role for funders, like grant makers, foundations and others, to propose as well as funding the digital gaps in CSOs, and as well as to support learning on security and so forth. Um, should that be one of the actions um, as well towards the funding community? Um, who wants to go for that answer? Um, Marcus, I'm looking at you, but um, whoever. <laughs> I, I could try to start and Radka Vodka maybe you chime in. Uh, I would say a twofold one. Um, in our in our work with with House Stiftens, we we talk to founders, we talk to foundations who want to interact with civil society organizations and really make a difference and do that with the best of intentions. So, if funders are in the audience uh, directly to you, think of this as a two-folded opportunity. Number one is um, we understand that funding work that directly correlates with impact is meaningful and is what is at the heart of most of funders. And we appreciate that. And I think that should also stay like this. Um, I will say that I think there is an opportunity to just consider infrastructure costs, opportunities, everything that goes next to the impact work that nonprofits do and consider that when you do fund organizations. And the second one is, an, is a very, I, I think after today's uh, conversation, almost a, an obvious opportunity is to think outside the box and maybe think about funding IT training directly, staffing, all of the resource constraints, try to close the gaps that we talked about today. I think those would be good starting points. Okay, great. Um, does do anybody else want to comment on that? Um, yeah. Uh, I would like to follow up on that. Uh, of course, that that uh, there is a role for funders in all this. And if you are interested, come here. We are always looking for new partners to, to help us uh, to help us support nonprofits, and and we all benefit from a strong and efficient uh, civil sector and and uh, uh, nonprofit organizations because they do provide very essential services that no one else is providing. So so to, to <laughs> and uh, they very often times if you are if we are a big employer that very often times provide services that your own employees need so it's in in everyone's benefit to support them and uh, i know that that supporting infrastructural needs does not sound very sexy it does not you are not saving lives of uh, of uh, hungry children in Africa, you are not supporting climate change, but in a way you actually are. And, and in, even in a bigger scale, it's kind of hidden behind it. But, but organization that has the infrastructure that it needs to, to actually do their work efficiently is the only organization you want to have. So, so I would maybe, uh, uh, I would maybe propose to, to companies and funders to, to be more willing to, to support and to give money and services that help with infrastructural needs because that's lacking. Yeah, I mean, it certainly is clear that without infrastructure, without the skills, without the capacity, um, I mean, I just imagine all of the work, I'm, I mean, I'm doing with the UN or the European Committee, I mean, all of these organizations investing so much in digital that if, if the NGOs, if civil society doesn't have that kind of equity, it's, it's going to be really tough. 
Um, I'm just going to jump to another question now from Paola Monti. Um, you pointed out that the surveys covered also digital signatures adoption. Hmm. I'm going to turn to you, Radka, because you mentioned this. Can, can you provide us with some specific findings on the use of electronic signatures in the interviewed organisations? Um, I mean, is this technology already in use in these NGOs? Radka, I'm going to come to you again for that yeah. question. Yeah, so we specifically asked uh, about that in our survey and actually kind of surprisingly, it turns out that 40% of organizations do use some, uh, some tools for uh, electronic signatures. Uh, Though it mainly is because uh, uh, a lot of organizations got used to uh, signing, you know, <laughs> grant applications with uh, uh, with the signature with an electro certified electronic signature, which is provided uh, by state, uh, because it helps them uh, to 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 do all the grant application process electronically, and and it's uh, actually uh, sometimes demanded by uh, by uh, government institutions. Institutions. So that's one of the reasons. So when, when we uh, asked about the specific tools, then uh, the electronic certified electronic signature was like the number one uh, tool, even though it's not a tool by itself. But also we, we saw many organizations using uh, using solutions like DocuSign and, and others. So, so yes, the NGO sector knows that it exists and they are using it. And I believe that though that uh, the adoption can be uh, can be bigger, uh, we, we ourselves are using uh, 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 tools for uh, electronic signatures and it help us a great deal. So, so we are promoting it to NGOs very happily. That's great. Thanks, and if Rebecca. I could, can oh, I just yes, build on that course, for, for 30 yes. seconds? Um, because yeah, I think absolutely. this also helps maybe illustrate something that I tried to explain earlier in more abstract terms, and that is how do we think about being a digitized organization? And I think this is a good example of something that has historically been done with pen and paper, applying for grants, signing that, sending it by mail, et cetera, gets digitized amazing but think about and what we want to encourage with organizations is think about how that larger topic which which i would consider as identity management how do you legit know that the person that you are trying to serve work with is who they claim to be how can you deliver a service faster via digital tool with the aid of identity management how can you if you are a nonprofit serving a certain subgroup within a community knowing that their identity is cleared, have a better service to them. And I think this is the conversation that we need to start within the communities of, yes, transferring legacy processes, but also moving beyond that. And I think this is a great example for that. Excellent, thank you, Marcus. Um, I'm gonna to turn to another question now, and Bogdan, I'm gonna ask you first. <laughs> Don't, uh, don't relax yet, um, we, we want to pick your brain. So we have another question, will the data, um, what will the data use, be used for from the research um, that you've undertaken? Um, would it be used for drafting recommendations or maybe concrete actions to improve the state of play in the um, information, um, communication and technology uh, sector, ICT, if I've got that right? And if actions, um, who do you think should take the leading role in implementing those actions? So the question's all about what are you going to do now with the research data? Is it, is it going to be used for recommendations, concrete actions? And how, how can you, what do you need? Um, how do you expect um, to move forward in making, um, in, in filling those gaps essentially on the research? Mm -hmm. well done. Thank you, Joanna. I think all three of us just already mentioned that uh, we use uh, results to plan our own activities. We also promote results to maybe influence is a hard work, but try to somehow influence uh, priorities of funders, donor organizations. And uh, again, there's TechSoup Global Network. I, I think it's a great vehicle, it's a great instrument to promote all these results in order to try to have global influence. Very interesting. And so, um, Marcus or Radka, did you have something else to say to that? Or should we jump to the next question? Okay, well, actually, I've got a question now. Um, and I want to ask, um, we want, I want to get back to the cloud actually. Um, 
and I wrote down a question earlier. So, what are you what are you actually doing to help organisations move to the cloud, Marcus? Marcus first. Uh, I think this again starts with both infrastructure resources and then know how. Um, we are fortunate enough as a TechSoup network, I think, to work together with some of the most leading cloud brands. Uh, and for us, it's a tremendous opportunity to, to be able to offer those services, uh, but also educate nonprofits on how they can best utilize it. So in essence, uh, that's it, right? Making sure that the correct solution uh, is at play uh, and that the organizations know how they act on that equity that they have been given. And do and you have, I, I was looking at your survey that only 21% um, predominantly use cloud offerings right now. So there's a lot of potential there. Um, Bogdan, cloud solutions in Ukraine, how's that going? Uh, I didn't answer a question on COVID, but actually COVID is a probably main factor that pushed Ukrainian nonprofits to clouds. So it's, it's it, it, we made a great progress during the last two years, but still a lot of things to do in the future. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I know Radka's talked already about the cloud as well. Um, I just wanted to ask you, because we're coming into the final minutes, so um, what advice do you have then in a, in a short um, sentence for change makers and the funders, the participants, the people listening today? What advice do you have for funders who want to do more good in society? Um, Bogdan. I try to be optimistic. Just uh, keep doing what you're doing and uh, listen to our recommendations and conclusions we draw from our uh, studies. Great, Ragda, Ragda, Radka, what would you say? So generally, uh, don't be afraid to support infrastructural development of NGOs. It is sexy, it can be sexy. And uh, for those of you who are from companies, uh, don't be afraid to, to support NGOs with what you actually do. So if you are a technological company, you can provide your services to NGOs for free or with discount. And I would also encourage you to include your employees to, in this process and have them uh, have them do expert volunteering work with NGOs because one of the things that we said and I think that goes for all of our countries and, and NGOs in general is the lack of skills and um, the companies that, that uh, support their employees to actually help NGOs or, or cooperate with NGOs because the, the learning curve is on both sides with those corporations uh, that's, that's, uh, that's beneficial and that can sometimes uh, help even more than few hundred euros uh, given to that NGO. Give them, give them eight consultation hours that, that, can, that can have much a much bigger impact. Thank you, thank you, Radka. And Marcus, um, the final call, <laughs> what would you expect? What could you hope for? Yeah, I would uh, again come back to that saying or, or phrase of uh, whatever you do, moving forward, please do mind the gap. Um, if we are not sure, uh, or if we're not careful about how we spend, how we engage with civil society organizations, there is a threat uh, for a digital divide in that sphere. Um, but however, if we manage to overcome that, which I'm very optimistic again about, then I think we are on track uh, as a community together to really uh, utilize on the potential that is out there and create a more robust and resilient uh, civil society. Thank you so much. And thank you to all. We're coming into the final minutes now. Thank you. What a great discussion. I feel like we could stay and hear many more data points and many and, and kind of real brainstorm on this. But we've learned several things. Um, my takeaways are one, there's a massive demand for digital capacity among NGOs. Two, there's a huge potential of what uh, and also risk. Um, for inaction, um, there's a huge potential for what digitally empowered NGOs can achieve. Well, uh, and the extreme vulnerabilities facing them if they're not digitally enabled. So um, what I've learned is that the NGOs need additional resources to be able to, to budget for digital infrastructure and cloud technology to increase their ability to communicate, communicate collaborate and to operate. 
And we need to work together, that's for, for sure. Two of our uh, partners here today have partners, funder partners to enable their research. So working together, collaboration is key in today's world. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you for your data insights. Thank you, TechSoup Global Partners Network, um, partners for listening and participating in this shared mission to support NGOs who work better together to strengthen the outcomes of our work together. And a final thought. The digital transition goes hand in hand with the green and socially just transition in Europe that's underway. So investing in NGO capacity at all levels to deliver effective voice and agency really depends on you, on all of us, and, and on digital investment in skills, infrastructure, know-how, and basics like cloud technology. If civil society organizations that are not community safety nets aren't empowered to collaborate digitally, then we'll all lose out, society and democracy included. Thank you all um, very much. And uh, we'll stay in touch. TechSoup Global Network will stay in touch with you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.